seems really odd in today's world that we have more than ever before, and yet we think in a very lack state. There's a world of abundance and an attitude of lack. The problem is that we are not eating food anymore. We are eating food like products, and they are adorned. They are made to look better and smell better so that people are attracted to them. The marketing essentially lies to you because it presents you with the promise you're going to be sexy and popular and cool, but in reality, you're going to be obese and miserable and sick. I think we're barking up the wrong tree. People are looking for a result that is superficial. They're looking just to look good. And they don't really consider that that could be done from the inside out. The first chapter of the first book that I ever wrote was called Diets Don't Work. It's because they're temporary. They have failure built right into them. You can lose weight on a diet, but it's a little bit like borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. I mean, you can get 10 pounds off your body through sheer force, but you're going to have to pay back with interest. People know this, so why are highly intelligent people not stopping? Because they don't know the nature of the trap. There was a point where I had allowed myself to get to 300 pounds, and that world, as opposed to the current world, uh, is vastly different. Life was just not fun. You know, the only fun I had was watching people on TV having fun. I was over 400 pounds, and I had very bad sleep apnea. I was borderline type 2 diabetic. I was a cheeseburger away from a heart attack, and I said, no more. This is how we are as mammals. It's not your fault. You're programmed to put on fat whenever there is food available. I was 31 when I realized, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to take care of myself, and I am sick. And so I had to go back and learn all the things that I wish I had known as a child. Sugar is without question the cocaine of the food world, but they kind of get away with hiding that drug within quote unquote food. Sugar is in everything. In America, we're eating about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. When we get onto our real diet in the sense of what a species habitually eats to sustain itself, we don't have to think about these things anymore. This is a really prevalent problem today because people are overfed, uh, but they're also starving to death. violating our body's basic survival laws. The whole dieting paradigm is flawed. It's not just what you're eating, it's also what's eating you. All through our history as a species, the big challenge is to find calories. And so our bodies are biologically adapted to this. We, we seek calorie sources. When I say that, I particularly what I'm talking about are fats and sugars. If we taste something fatty or something sweet, we get an immediate signal saying, yes, I want more of this. Because for our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and that goes right up to a few hundred years ago, um, anywhere they could find fat or sugar meant survival for those people. It meant um, carrying forth their genetics. It's not your fault. This, isn't, this is how we are as mammals. I mean, we've lived on the earth for a millennium where there was a food shortage. You're programmed to put on fat whenever there is food available. But now there's a lot of food available, but it's the wrong kind. And so we've been programmed for millennia to store up for the winter, but the winter doesn't come. Thousands of years ago when we lived outdoors and we didn't know where our next meal was coming from, if there was a famine because it was a cold winter or, or whatever reason, your body is going to want to hold extra weight to protect you from that, and a famine is a stress. 
And if you go through that stress, your body's going to say, we need an extra 10, 10 pounds to protect us against famines. But one of the really interesting things about hunter-gatherer people, or people who do a very moderate amount of agriculture, we could call them hunter-gatherer gardeners, what we see in those people is that they have an extremely high amount of nutrition, an extremely low amount of calories in their food compared to uh, people in modern civilization which have a very high amount of calories and a very low amount of nutrition available to them. Today we have so many calorie sources but we still have the same signal. So somebody bites into a burger or they take a sip off a milkshake and they get those fats and those sugars and their body says yes more because it's used to behaving in an environment where there's feast and there's famine. The problem is we got feast like nobody's business, we just don't have any famine. You could be eating to your heart's content. You could eat 10,000 calories a day. And if you're not getting the specific nutrients your body needs in a way that they can digest and assimilate, then you're starving on a nutritional basis. And as long as you're starving on a nutritional basis, your body's gonna stay hungry to get those specific nutrients. Now, man-made foods like bread and sugar trick your body into thinking, and table salt as a matter of fact, trick your body into thinking you're getting specific nutrients. And so your body stays hungry for, for them, but then the cells don't get nourished. And as long as the cells aren't getting nourished, you're starving on a cellular level. So what happens for average person is, today in our civilization, is they're not getting enough, say, vitamin A. They're not getting enough vitamin D. They're not even getting enough vitamin C. They're chronically starved of nutrients, so they keep eating and eating and eating, but the foods that they keep eating don't have enough of these nutrients for them ever to get the stock that they need, but what those foods do have is a lot of calories. So what happens is they start to pack these calories onto their body in the form of body fat, and the body starts to accumulate or bioaccumulate too much uh, not just fat, but also all the associated pollutants that are in that food supply. We see things like diabetes, right? We see blood sugar imbalance issues, and we see a lot of weight gain. And so this is a really prevalent problem today because people are overfed, uh, but they're also starving to death. I was 31 when I realized I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to take care of myself and I am sick. And so I had to go back and learn all the things that I wish I had known as a child, as a, a teenager, as a young adult. Step one was just going back and understanding how do I take care of myself? What do I put in this body that is compromised at this point? You know, how do I boost my immune system? How do I increase my longevity? And again, that comes back to what you eat, what you drink, and what you think. From a very cursory surface perspective, what's actually happened is, is that we left farms, we got to living in cities, and forgot about our instincts. And that's led to an obesity crisis, it's led to a crisis of misunderstanding of what a natural diet includes, and it's also left us with a, with a, bit of, a little bit of a despair and confusion. We, we don't know what to do now. The problem is that we are not eating food anymore. We are eating food like products and they are adorned. They are made to look better and, and, and smell better and be presented so that people are attracted to them. And not only that, they are also made so that they can have a long shelf life. Otherwise the supermarket would be losing money and the manufacturers as well. So the objective is not really to give you a healthy product is to give you a product that will make you buy it, that will last long and will make, make a lot of profit for the company that's producing it, right? Ugh, okay, 9.15, could be worse. Oh yeah, it's worse. Oh my goodness, it's Jason.
hi there. Hi. Your hair looks nice today. He likes my hair. Hang on, what's that supposed to mean? What about every other day? He's looking at you quick, say something. Thanks, you too. We've got this processed junk food diet that people are on, but it's also combined with this new, relatively new, indoor lifestyle. You know, uh, our bodies were not designed to sit at desks under fluorescent lights in an office cubicle and chow down processed junk food all day long without getting exercise. And if you do just one of these things, uh, it, it may not be so bad, but by combining them both, then you end up with a disaster where you've got way too many calories, not enough nutrients, and not enough use of, of those calories. And those particular factors, when combined together, create an obesity epidemic, they create a low energy epidemic, they create a fog in cognition, they create an environment where people begin to lose the will to take self-responsibility, so then they turn it all over to a doctor who's only able to prescribe a pharmaceutical pill, which doesn't address the real symptoms, which are varied and complex. For me, the biggest cause of obesity, bar none, is addiction. But to understand the level of addiction that we've got uh, might be challenging for some because, of course, people can understand the addiction to cigarettes because that has now been proven. They can understand the addiction to alcohol. Um, but with food, people say, look, I can stop eating. But unfortunately, like the tobacco companies, if you go back in the late 60s, early 70s, and they knowingly added more nicotine to cigarettes in order to make them addictive. I used to smoke 40, 60 cigarettes a day. Why did I? One cigarette led to a chain reaction that then led to another one and another one another one. Now look, I said to people, look, the reason why I smoke is because I enjoy it because I love it. But I would hit my head on the pillow praying that I'd wake up and become a non-smoker every day. Every smoker on earth would love to not want cigarettes if they could. There is an invisible prison, if you will, that captures people in the nicotine trap. The need for a cigarette is only caused by the last one because when you have a cigarette, nicotine goes in your system. Nicotine has to get out of your system or you will die. When somebody has a cigarette after they're withdrawn from nicotine, it replaces the nicotine back into their bloodstream. And they feel better, they feel good. But that's like putting on a pair of tight shoes to get the pleasure of taking them off. And the way that cigarettes are addictive uh, is much in the same way that certain foods are addictive. They know why they shouldn't do it, but they have no idea why they are doing it. The food companies engineer addictions, I believe, into many of the foods. The food industry is multi-billions, tens of billions of dollars, and they have the the wherewithal and the science resources to really identify very carefully what uh, appeals to the average consumer. And as a result of that, they can use these chemical derivatives to create these concoctions, which really taste quite, quite good and, and, and can have an addictive component. MSG is in 80% of all flavored foods that you get at a restaurant, that you get at a grocery store. It, it makes you want to eat more, but it does something else. It actually excites a part of your brain that's in charge of the fat programs. Ke the chemical of MSG excites the brain. And due to that, ex that excitation, your body acts, activates the fat programs and gets fatter. And everybody knows this. Everybody, every, like scientists know this, everybody knows this and no one's saying anything. How do I know everybody knows this? Well, 
When you want to study obesity and you want to study a fat mouse, you've got to make a mouse fat because mice aren't fat. So the way you make a mouse fat is you feed him MSG. And there's even a term for it, MSG obesity induced mice. If you do a search for MSG obesity induced mice, you'll see tons of research reports where they talk about, well, we, the protocol was we made the mouse fat feeding them this much MSG, blah, 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 blah. And then we studied this, this, and this, and the other thing. They're not studying that. They're just, that's the protocol for making a mouse fat is feeding them MSG. And this is in 80% of modern day foods. A food, let's say a, a processed refined sugar food or a soda, it will deliver something, a, a biochemical change in your brain. It will make you momentarily uplifted or momentarily happy. And people get, they get used to that feeling and they want to slam cookies or cake or soda to get that momentary, momentary feeling of, of feeling elated. But then that feeling uh, soon, very quickly drops off and you're left empty. You know, where's the food? Where's the nutrients? Uh, where are the things that the body and the mind really crave? And the answer from the food company's point of view is to go back and buy another can. If I was in the food industry, what am I looking to do? I want to sell you more food. That's all I want to do. Now, how can I do that? I can manipulate the chemical structure of their food so that it now becomes not fulfilling but empty, but gives the impression when they very first ingest it that it is the most fulfilling thing they've ever had. Nothing else does it in your brain quite like a diet cola. And that's because there's a, there's a deadly combination there of aspartame and caffeine. And those two together create a very unique blend of excitotoxin that kills off brain cells. But before they die, they have this excitement that's like a buzz. So what you find with the Diet Cola addicts is that they'll drink sometimes a, a liter, two liters a day, and particularly women, do it as a way to keep their weight down. They don't eat, they just have the next buzz of Diet Colas. Aspartame causes formaldehyde buildup in the brain. It causes frontal lobe inflammation. Migraines can be a common one. Visual disturbances. Symptoms that mimic multiple sclerosis. There's headaches, there's neurologic problems. Seizures in, in more serious cases. Cognitive problems and can in fact lead to different types of cancers. Actually, it's most pilots are aware that they can't drink diet sodas because it's well recognized within the, within the a pilot association that you just don't drink this because it can really cause severe aberrations in your vision that will, will potentially lead to, to problems with your flying. If you look at the studies that examined the toxicity of aspartame done by Dr. Walton, of the 90 studies that were done that showed that there was no side effects from aspartame, over 90% of those were funded by industry. And you have a, almost the same number of other studies that were independently funded, finding the exact reverse, 90% of them showing problems with it. Some of the artificial sweeteners have been proven not only to have horrific side effects over a long period of use, but they cause carbohydrate cravings. So when somebody has a diet drink, and they're wondering why they're not getting thin and why they're craving even more carbohydrates is because those substances have been very, very carefully designed not to help you. They're into just selling and marketing.